cuff. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, yet I wait for thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy promise, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant, when wilt thou be avenged of them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are true, they persecute me falsely, be thou my help. They had almost made an end upon me on the earth, but I forsook not thy commandments. Quicken me according to thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimonies of thy mouth. If we could rightly call to our remembrance the promises of God in our afflictions and miseries, it were sufficient enough to make us patient. And by this means we should render a true proof of our faith, but so soon as we are grieved with any affliction, we by and by wax faint-hearted, because we forget all the promises of God, which to our seeming we had long before very well understand and learned. Now we should not at the least be forgetful of them, when need requireth, yea, and that when we are thereby enforced. And for that cause we have here a very excellent lesson for the purpose, and worthy the noting, for David doth not only teach us as a prophet of God what our duty is, and what the power and virtue of our faith ought to be, but showeth us also the way by his example, how we must be patient in all our adversities, and how we ought not to fall from that, to wit that we always have our eye fixed upon the promises of God. For that shall be enough to entertain and keep us in such sort as that we should patiently wait for his saving health, yea, even in calling upon him but that we might the better profit by this doctrine, we are here to note that the two first verses are both of one and the selfsame substance, save that the order of the words are changed. He saith in the first place, My soul fainteth for thy salvation. That is to say, O Lord, I have longed, albeit the afflictions and miseries which I have abidden were very great, and lasted long, and that I see neither end nor issue of them, Yet nevertheless I rested altogether hereon, that I always trusted that thou wouldst be my supporter and aider. Now he addeth the reason how he could so faint, to wit, because he trusted unto the promises of God. In the second verse he saith, that he hath failed for the promise of God, yea, even looking for this promise, and that he hath said, When wilt thou comfort me? And in the third he handleth that which before he had spoken of, to wit, that although he had been as it were parched and dried, even as a skin bottle in the smoke, so that there remained neither moisture nor substance in him, but dried up with very miseries, yet that he had not forgotten the testimonies of God. We see then now what the sum and effect of this is which is here showed unto us, to wit, that there is but one only means to cause us to be constant and patient when as we are afflicted, and that our adversities do ever long last as we imagine, that is, to be mindful of the promises of God, and to have them deeply imprinted in our hearts. For if that be so, it will not cost us much to be patient, and although it be an hard matter, yet we shall at the last come to the end of it. Let us then now mark from whence our impatience springeth, and what the reason is why we are so oftentimes overcome with temptations, or else, when as we shall have for a time resisted them, yet in the end we are confounded and faint-hearted. Truly, it is because we forget the testimonies of God, and turn away from His word. In very deed, this at the first sight might seem to be a common matter with us, and to say the truth, every man will say that we ought to remember them, and that it is the only remedy to comfort us. But we shall the oftener do it, when as we shall have learnt this lesson which is here set down unto us, and that we record it all the days of our life. For this is one of the principal points that is to be required in all Christians, that when they perceive that God hath laid his hand on them, that they be as it were almost cast down, yet that they might comfort themselves in staying of the promises of salvation which God hath promised them. But yet let us thoroughly consider the word which David here useth, I have longed, saith he, after the salvation, and I have hoped, or after that I had hoped, because of thy word. The second part of this verse is, as it were, the foundation whereon David buildeth. Let us understand then this hope, which we ought to have in the word of God as David had. For without that it is impossible, but that we must be confounded. For although it seem in the judgment of men that there is in us some virtue and soundness to endure and suffer patiently, 
yet shall it not be such a true patience as God alloweth. And why so? For we shall never bear him that affection to obey us, without we comfort ourselves that he loveth us, and that we trust to his bounty. A man, I say, shall never be disposed to obey God and to glorify him in afflictions, except he have a taste of the bounty and fatherly love which he beareth us. Now how can it be that we should be fully persuaded that God loveth us, and procureth our wealth and health, when as he afflicteth us, without we be armed with his promises? For it is impossible for us to know the truth of God, except he declare the same unto us in his word. Let us learn then, as I have already said, that the patience of the faithful cannot be built but upon faith and hope in the promises of God. Lo then what we have to note in this place. Now David, having laid such a foundation, buildeth thereon, saying that his soul longed after the salvation of God. When he saith that his soul longed, he meaneth not that he was so forlorn as that he had in the end given him clean over, nor yet that Satan had gotten any advantage of him. But that word to long is taken in the scripture for that which notwithstanding is conjoined with such obedience as we ought to yield unto God, staying and settling ourselves upon him. As how St. Paul saith that we ought to hope beyond all hope, as Abraham did, to wit, we must surmount all our wits and imaginations when there is any question of our belief in God. For if we will measure the promises of God by our own wits, what shall become of it? Our faith then must exceed and go beyond all the wisdom of men, as here it is said, that his soul hath longed, which is as much as if David had said, It is true, O Lord, that according to man's reason I was utterly forlorn, yet I was so oppressed with miseries as that I could bear no more. But when I was in the midst of death, I ceased not for all that until I was arrived at a sure haven, to wit, thy aid and help. Now he namely speaketh of God's succour, because it shall go very hard, but that we will wander, look above and beneath, both before and behind, to see if we can find ready help. But if the trouble last long, and we see not which way to get out of it, but that it is like a bottomless pit, although before we somewhat trusted and hoped upon God, yet for all that we shall then be driven and egged to seek for aid here and there, we know not where. And how so? Is it not possible for me to find remedy? Because, I say, we are so dull, and the hope which we have in God passeth so lightly away from us, and melteth and runneth about, this way and that way, David for this reason saith that he hoped for the salvation of God. Hereby then he showeth that although this occasion was offered him to seek after other helps, and to call his eyes upon creatures, and to forsake God, yet that the temptations had not so won upon him, but that he always remained constant in this resolution, that it was God which must relieve his need. Now hereupon he addeth, Mine eyes fail for thy promise, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? I have already said that this verse containeth no new or strange thing, but David changeth only the order of the words. For when he saith that his eyes sore longed after the word of God, he meaneth none other thing but this, that although all his wits were troubled, and that he was, as it were, blinded with the multitude of afflictions which he endured, yet that he always stayed himself upon this word of God, and never ceased calling upon him, saying, O oh, when wilt thou comfort me? By this he showeth us that if we have a true faith settled upon the promises of God made unto us, when, as it shall please him soon after to afflict us, we must not by and by be angry, biting the bit as mules do, but let us yield him true obedience, saying, O Lord, when wilt thou comfort me? We must then suffer and abide thus to do, to wit, that when we beseech and require God to help us according to his promise, we must also desire him to show it us by the effect, and we must remain firm and constant until such time as he causeth us to perceive it, for although he delayeth his aid, and holdeth it as it were in suspense, yet must we be fully persuaded that he hath not forgotten his office, which is to comfort us. By this means we shall find in the end the fruit of our prayers." Now he fully and wholly explaineth in the third verse following, when, as he showeth it to be no small matter to be thus cast down, had not the word of God sustained and upheld him, but that there was great reason in it. I am, saith he, like unto a goat's skin, wherein oil or wine is put, hanging in the smoke, and so dried and parched, as that there was neither substance nor moisture left in him. 
David useth this similitude to show that his afflictions were so great and excessive, as that he was without all strength and without hope of life. Now he addeth notwithstanding, that he did not yet forget the statutes of God. Lo, an example which we ought to follow, neither must we allege here our infirmity, for David was a passionate man as we are. He might very well have fainted if God had not strengthened him. And how so? Having the promises, he hoped upon them, knowing that God continueth his benefits towards his children, because they should have recourse unto him. He calleth upon him, for that he had already found mercy and succour in him. God so hold him through his Holy Spirit. Now, have not we at this day the same promises which David had? Yea, have we not more large and ample promises? Have not we a great deal more familiar access than David had, because that Jesus Christ is declared to be a mediator more manifestly than he was under the law? When God then rendereth us such a testimony of his good will, that we may freely come before him, to pray unto him, to the end he might help our necessities, I pray you, what excuse shall we make if we come not boldly unto him as David did, and be constant to persevere in the same purpose, seeing that God offereth the selfsame means to fight against whatsoever may turn us away from it? Moreover, is the power of God lessened since that time? Doth he not at this day help all his faithful with his Holy Spirit, as he did under the law? Yea, doth he not say that he will increase the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ more than ever he did at that time? There is nothing then but our unthankfulness which hath shut the gate against God, so that his graces can have no access nor entrance into us. It is very true that he will say enough unto us, but we will stop our ears. He will make us fair promises enough, but we will soon forget them, or else, if we keep them in mind, it shall be but a ranging imagination, neither shall it have any deep print or yet lively root in us. Because, therefore, that we esteem not of the promises of God, lo, the reason why we are so suddenly cast down, even with the least temptation that may come. How exercise we our faith in prayers! What readiness and zeal is there at this day amongst Christians in calling upon the name of God! Alas, it is so cold and feeble as it cannot be more. And so see why God hath plucked back his hand from us, because of our infidelity, so that we feel not his help as we should. The more deeply, therefore, ought we to consider of this sentence here, when David declareth that he was clean dried up, and yet for all that forgot not the promises of God. Let us now go and vaunt ourselves to be good Christians, that we have greatly profited in the gospel, and yet, when as we shall be touched with any little, yea, and that with a very light affliction, we shall be so amazed as it is wonder. Alas, what should become of us if we should be as David protesteth he was, that God threatened us through stitch, that there was but one drop of substance of life, and that it should seem that we were even as it were dead. If then there were such a kind of parched dryness in us, what should become of it? But what? Herein resteth the fault that every man flattereth himself, and we also think that God should submit himself to our flatteries. But it is not in vain that this example is here set before us. Let us exercise ourselves then better than we have heretofore done, and call to mind the testimonies of God. When as we shall be parched and so dried, as that it might seem we had not one drop of life, let us notwithstanding meditate yet more than ever before we did on the promises of God, to the end he might get us new force and strength. Now when David had thus spoken, he addeth, how many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou be avenged of them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. Here David, pursuing his purpose, maketh mention of the griefs which he endured, that is, the wicked and ungodly persecuted him wrongfully, and that he, being retired to God, as his safeguard, found no succour of him at the first dash, but that God held him at a bay, as a forlorn man. Now hereupon he rightly showeth that his faith was not clearly quenched, nor yet lessened, but that he still continued in prayer. And in the end concludeth that he will yet better remember the word of God, whenas he shall be so restored by him, and raised up again, as it were from death. Let us then note that David here setteth down a certain manner and order to show us that when God to the outward show shall seem to estrange himself, 
yet we must take heed that the same keep us not from having recourse unto him. Now it may very well seem that God sometimes thinketh not of us, but specially when he shall suffer the wicked to run whither they list, and let them do whatsoever they desire. Now this is a terrible temptation. And why? For on the one side we look that if God took us for his children, and loved us as he testifieth, should he not by and by have compassion of our miseries? Should he not put forth his hand to help us? When then he suffereth us to be thus unjustly trodden under foot, it is a sign that he hath forsaken us, and that he hath no care of us, nor of our health. Lo, here a very hard and grievous temptation. And the second is that it should seem that God doth not his office. How is that? Behold how the ungodly fall out with him, so that it seemeth they would give him open defiance, for is not this to make war against him, when as they give themselves license to do wickedly, that whatsoever can be said unto them, they can never be brought to goodness, and yet God maketh semblance as though he had no care of their wicked dealing? These, we see, are two marvellous dangerous temptations. And this is the cause, namely, why David hath here recited his persecutions, which he abode at the hands of the wicked. Now it is so that he, being in such conflicts, having to fight against these two temptations, which I have noted, showeth right well that he remained still conqueror. And see why he saith, How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou be avenged of them that persecute me? David signifieth that he made not this request until such time as he was driven to this extremity, that he was no longer able to abide it as if he should have said, Alas, my good God, wilt thou help me after I am dead? For thou seest that I have already abidden so much, as it is not possible to endure more, thou seest me even at the grave's brink. It is now time, or else never, to help, but yet I perceive no succour coming from thee, and what is the cause? When wilt thou do it? It cannot be chosen, but that David had, as it were, an intolerable affliction when he called upon God in this manner. Wherefore we are so much the rather to meditate on this place. For although God suffereth us to be afflicted, but for a little while, yet the same lasteth so with us, as that we, being vexed even to the uttermost, will say, I know not where I am, nor what to do herein. What is the cause why God deferreth his aid so long? For instead to call upon him, it is out of doubt rather that we murmur, yea, and moit as it were secretly against him. Now the right remedy to overcome these temptations, and not so to murmur against God in our afflictions, is this, to call upon him with full assurance, beseeching him to grant us his grace, that notwithstanding all the afflictions which he layeth upon us, yet that he leave us not for all that, to hope after that which he hath promised us. And this is it which David declareth yet more fully, when after he had said that the ungodly had gone about to dig pits for him, which is not after his law, he addeth, and saith, All thy commandments are true, they persecute me falsely. Be thou my help. He here expresseth what the injuries and outrages were which they had done him. They have, saith he, dug pits for me, yea, and he protesteth that they did it unjustly, that he never gave the wicked occasion to hurt him, but that he had walked in a good and pure conscience. Yet, saith he, they have gone about to circumvent and compass me round about. We see then that David had no small assaults, but such as were even deadly, that it was without all question that he must be utterly confounded, yea, and although he never hurt any of them, that it might be said that he had injuriously persecuted them, yet had he always his recourse unto God. So then we may now be better confirmed in the doctrine which we have heretofore handled, to wit, that to whatsoever extremity we are driven unto in our afflictions, we shall bring them to a very good end, when as we, being fenced with the power of the Spirit of God, do look unto his promises. Now let us see why he addeth and saith, Thy commandments are true, they persecute me falsely, O help me. David setteth down here three points. The one is that God is true, and after he addeth a protestation of his good conduct and guidance, and of the malice of his adversaries. Thirdly, he calleth upon God in his afflictions. Now, as concerning the first, he showeth us that although Satan, to shake us, and in the end utterly to carry us away, subtly and cunningly goeth about to deceive us, 
we must, on the contrary, learn how to know his ambushes, and to keep us from out of them. So often, then, as we are grieved with adversity and affliction, where must we begin? See Satan, how he pitcheth his nets, and layeth his ambushes, to induce and persuade us to come into them. What saith he? Dost thou not see thyself forsaken of thy God? Where are the promises whereunto thou didst trust? Now, here thou seest thyself to be a wretched forlorn creature. So then thou right well seest that God hath deceived thee, and that the promises whereunto thou trustest appertain nothing at all unto thee. See here the subtlety of Satan. What is now to be done? We are to conclude with David, and say, Yet God is true and faithful. Let us, I say, keep in mind the truth of God as a shield to beat back whatsoever Satan is able to lay unto our charge, whenas he shall go about to cause us to deny our faith, whenas also he shall lie about us to make us believe that God thinketh no more of us, or else that it is in vain for us to trust unto his promises. But let us know clean contrary that it is very plain and sound truth which God saith unto us. Although Satan casteth at us never so many darts, although he have never so exceeding many devices against us, although now and then by violence, sometimes with subtlety and cunning, it seemeth in very deed to us that he should overcome us, nevertheless he shall never bring it to pass, but that we shall have the truth of God to be sure and certain in our hearts. And thus much for the first. The protestation which David maketh, ought to stir us up to walk in such sort with our neighbours, as that we give them no occasion to hurt us. But to live plainly and simply one by another. The wicked may very well hurt one another, yea, and even destroy themselves, but in the meantime the children of God must have this testimony always with them, that they will neither do nor yet procure them any hurt, but are grieved and sorrowful to see them run headlong into destruction. When this mind shall be in us, then shall we have an excellent entrance to call upon God. But, contrarywise, if we render evil for evil, being molested by our enemies, and enforce ourselves to do the like, and cry quittance, as we say with them, our cause will be quite overthrown. And why so? For we shall be so vengeful, it is impossible for us to trust and believe that God will help us. Yea, even then, I say, when we shall have a good and just quarrel, for God will discharge us, if we shall not have a good conscience, and although some there are which would both wish and do us hurt, we must say, O Lord, this is injuriously and falsely done. But, as I have already touched, let us have such a testimony in our hearts, that although they which persecute us are the instruments and limbs of Satan, and do it of mere malice, let us not, clean contrary, purchase them any hurt or displeasure. Then may we call upon God with David, knowing that he will never fail those which are wrongfully persecuted. Lo, then, the meaning of these three points which are here touched. Now after that David had thus spoken, he addeth, They had almost made an end of me upon the earth, but I forsake not thy commandments. See here a sentence worthy to be well weighed. It is very true that David expresseth that which he had before spoken, I have not, saith he, forsaken thy commandments, O Lord, although I was as one clearly dried up, and as a man utterly forlorn, yet for all that have I not forsaken thy commandments. Now it must needs be that David resisted two temptations in continuing so firm and constant in the obedience of God. The first was that he might have been brought into some distress, the second that he might have been bent to have done wickedly. And why so? Seeing that the wicked had unjustly persecuted him, he might have been revenged of them. Lo, the two assaults, which was meet and convenient for him to sustain and keep of. Even so must we follow his example, for when men shall unjustly molest and grieve us, and that they shall not only do us one injury, yea, two or three, but that our trouble shall continue without end and without ceasing, let us yet learn to be patient, and chiefly, when as there shall be no question of abiding a little damage or small grief, but that we shall be mortally persecuted, and our life to be as it were desperate, to be already as it were in the very throat of the wolf, yea, to be already even as men swallowed up and devoured. 
when, as we shall be brought even to such a pass, yet let us not cease to say with David, I have not forsaken thy commandments. And so that we might the better practice this doctrine, and apply it to our own use and profit, let us learn to have recourse unto God in all our afflictions, calling upon him to be our warrant and safeguard. And in the meanwhile, although we be wrongfully molested, let us beseech him to grant us his grace, to yield ourselves unto that which he hath commanded us, to wit, to love our enemies, to do good unto them which seek to do us all the hurt they can, to pray for those which slander and wish us as much evil as is possible. Lo, here we must meditate upon the commandments of God, although we be, as it were, consumed on the earth. Now here we are to note that it was not without cause that David saith that he was almost consumed. For this shall even so come to pass in us, when men shall judge and condemn us, and that we have already received sentence of death in ourselves, as St. Paul saith in the second to the Corinthians. Even so, David, being as one condemned to death, and feeling no likelihood to be delivered, ceased not for all that to call upon God. So likewise we must do, knowing that he will never forsake us. For see what the cause is that God oftentimes keepeth back his helping hand from us, but even when we prevent him by means of our own lightness and constancy. For so soon as we are grieved somewhat more than we are wanted, we straightways conclude and say, Oh, all is naught. We are clean undone. It is past all hope. When we after this sort prevent him, it is like unto a man that would cast himself into his grave before he is dead, and so smother himself. After this manner, say I, do we, preventing by this means, that aid which God hath deferred to give us, until the time become which he knoweth to be most meet. Let us then well consider that when God shall defer the aid which he meaneth to give us, although we seem as dead men, and our life desperate, yet that he can restore us again in the minute of an hour, although in the sight of men we were even as the pictures of death, yet that he leaveth us not without life inwardly. For as we see in winter the trees to be as it were dead, that we can perceive neither sap, leaf, nor nothing else, yet there is life hid in them. Even so fareth it with us, for when we shall be still and quiet, attending for aid at the hands of God, we are sure that when winter is past, to wit, the time of our afflictions, that God will give us life, which was before, as it were, hidden. Now to conclude the psalm, he saith, Quicken me according to thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimonies of thy mouth. We see here that David speaketh as one that were dead, when he saith, O quicken me. He showeth then that he was not beaten softly with the rod, or with a mean affliction, but was punished even to the uttermost. For he was so dried up, as before we have said, that there was no substance at all left in him. Lo, what was the cause why David after this manner made his petition? Let us learn then not to flatter ourselves, when as the Lord our God shall visit us with any little affliction, that we think to have done even sufficiently if we call upon him. But if we shall have done so an hundred thousand times more, yet that we must not give over praying and calling upon him. And herein may be seen the hypocritical dealing of men, for they are so womanishly minded and tender-hearted that they think themselves to have wrought a million of miracles when as they have sustained never so little adversity. No, not worth the value of an hour. Moreover, if they be overloaden with any adversity, they may be bold, as they think, clearly to forget both God and his word. But our good God will not have us to proceed in this sort, for he setteth before us here the example of David for our instruction. But yet he hath set it forth unto us for this end and purpose, that we should not cease to continue to call upon him in our adversities. Yea, were our afflictions never so great and lasted never so long, yet that we should notwithstanding continually persevere in prayer. To be short, let us understand that David made this prayer at such time as he thought not to have lived any longer, but that he was as a dead man when he saith, O quicken me. Moreover, we may see that his constancy was not like a puff of wind, but that he persevered therein. For although his troubles contained, that he was, as it were, in a very deep pit, whereout he was not able to get. Yet ceased he never but to trust that God would deliver him out of it, and thereupon called on him and received great courage, namely, he desireth to be quickened according to the loving kindness of God. For we must also be at that point, 
if we will be heard, to know that God is bound unto us of his mere grace and favour, and that we also must have recourse unto him if we will have him to accomplish his promises unto us. Men must not then abuse themselves to look unto their own doings, nor yet to have regard unto worldly means, but that they seek for the same in God, and in his mere goodness and free gift, for the which he will hear them, and receive them also unto himself. In the end David protesteth that he will keep the testimonies of the mouth of God. Now let us not understand hereby that he had not kept them before, for we have seen the clean contrary. But this is to signify that, seeing in the midst of the afflictions which I have sustained, thou hast always given me the grace to persevere in faith, and that I have continually called upon thee, Satan hath not shaken me to cause me to do wickedly since then, O Lord, Thou hast given me such constancy at the time that thou wast estranged from me, by a more strong reason, when thou shalt be mine aid and succour, and shalt restore me, I shall have a far greater constancy to keep the testimonies of thy mouth. See then, how that in the midst of all our afflictions we must glorify God, not doubting of his faithful dealing, that he will perform whatsoever he hath promised, have pity on us in the end, and confirm us more and more to keep the testimonies of his mouth knowing that he will continue to do that unto us which he hath already once showed us. And according to this doctrine, let us prostrate ourselves in the presence of our good God, in acknowledging our offences, beseeching him that it would please him to open our eyes better, that we may behold the power and virtue of his word, and thereon to stay us, in bereaving us of all the lightness and inconstancy which might turn us away from it, desiring him also not to suffer us to wander this way and that way, as commonly we are wanted, to turn us from the right way, as we are by nature overmuch inclined thereto, but being fully resolved that it is not in vain which he hath declared unto us, that he will assist us in all our necessities, which we shall crave of him in true faith, yet not only in our small and mean afflictions, but even when as he thinketh we should be utterly overthrown, knowing that he will accomplish for our profit and health whatsoever we may hope after, and behold with the eyes of faith." Let us beseech him that he will not only grant us this grace, but also unto all people and nations of the earth, etc. End of Sermon 11